good times. You want to lose weight, do this for a week, two weeks. Keep on the way in here on foot. I don't know, 36 kilometers or something. I'm on the edge of death right now. I better uh, put this away and concentrate. I go two feet to the left, I'm gonna die. Almost awake. Not quite. Got my second copy with me, so be afraid. <laughs> Didn't manage to uh, hook up on the phone last night with the outfitter from up north, so I sent him a message to messenger today. It's so hard to get me on the phone for anyone, really. Um, oh, there's no service out here. There's no service out in the yard, and I'm rarely in the house. And then I had to go uh, rescue Sarah's vehicle from the logging road yesterday. So her tire shredded on the way home. Long story, got it done. What else? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to those guys and finding out what's going on up there. And as well, I'm going to inquire about me going up there too for I don't know when. And uh, it's funny, you know, you see the sheep horns right here in this time of year. August is when everybody's hunting mountain sheep up north. And it still gives me these pangs. Especially the week before the season opens because I can smell the, the saddles and the tack and the horses and, and the sounds of getting the, all the horses shod, ready to go. And the whole crew excited, ready to, that vibration. Everybody's getting ready to head in the mountains. And I'm not there. I just get I get those little pangs of pain. It's like, oh. I sit here and stare at my pack gear and my saddles behind me. And it's tough to swallow sometimes, I'll tell you what. But I'll be gone soon enough to get my own fix. End of, uh, what's my schedule? One month of fishing? Oh, yeah. No, uh, what's it? Book it at howtohunt.com if you want to go fishing. Sarah's taking care of all that. I got nothing to do with it. And how's that for a genius move? <laughs> She can't bitch at me for going away fishing too much because she booked it. <laughs> anyway, and then uh, Labor, Day, Labor Day long weekend, we do a two-day big fishing derby. And then I'm going to try to film some big, huge, silver, fresh chrome Chinook salmon on the river on the way home. And that's all she wrote. And then I pack up and I'm gone into the mountains. And who knows what's going to happen this year or what I'm going to film. And I get back into sharing crazy places with all of you instead of being inside this frickin' shop. 
or at the river or whatever. It's so limited here. It drives me bonkers. It drives me nuts not being able to go to the mountains anytime I want. You know, like previous years, I could go, I could hang up a chunk of meat in the timber with those big, huge cedars and uh, get all the first grizzly bears that come out of the den, get them on video. I can go, uh, I can see moose, mountain goats anytime I feel like it. And go to all those epic places in the coastal mountains whenever, like within a five minute drive from home nonstop. Now I can't. It's a little frustrating at times, but anyway, I'm babbling. A month of BC remote is coming up for me. Soon enough, and I'll share everything with all of you. I don't think I had anything too important I want to share today to annoy people with. So, It's time, it's time to get the voices heard. Um, all right, what's this? More from Drumheller, Alberta. Hey Steve, this is the third share from Jordan Kashuba of Drumheller, Alberta here. I hope your summer's going well out there on the coast. It certainly looks like fun to be a part-time outdoors man slash angler. To not settle for a job you hate just for the money is a wise way to operate in general. And most of us would do well to borrow that little philosophy from you in particular. I know I would. Good for you, bro. I talk about you and your channel, my friends, like I know you personally, LOL. <laughs> okay, so Randy is an arborist from Drum Heller and a good friend of mine. No nonsense, honest, smart and all that. A few years. I'm planning a little camping trip and I tell him about it and he says, just stay away from Wypress, Alberta. W-Y-P-R-E-S-S. -S. There's Sasquatches out there. Now actually, of course, I had to pry all the details out of him, so here it goes. Randy was big into dirt biking, hill climbing and trail riding in the Western Canadian Rockies when he was younger. He was a veteran rider, the type that wouldn't think twice about ripping up a steep hill on a narrow trail that most people would get nervous to watch, never mind ascending it. You know the type. So, Wypress is west of Calgary in the high foothills, first range of the mountains, and it's an area well known to motorsports enthusiasts for dirt bike trails and hill climbs. It's also an area that has come up two times in shares on your channel. Oh, really? That I know of. Back in the 90s, he's riding in Wypress with two other guys and they climb a steep, narrow hill, trail, heavily trees on both sides with Randy going fast, going last. At the top, instead of continuing down the other side, he stops his bike and stalls out. He decided to take a moment to glass over the side. He just rode up to his utter disbelief and amazement what he only described as to be an eight to nine foot classic Sasquatch steps out of the dark timber at the bottom of the hill he just rode up. Randy said in an instant, several things occurred to him. First, oh my God, they're freaking real. Second, it surely was listening to our bikes as this area is well used by dirt bikers and no doubt the creature had thought that I crested the hill and was headed down the other side. So he's stopping at the top and killing the motor. I tricked him into thinking it was safe to cross the path unseeing. The very moment that this thought crossed Randy's mind, this thing stopped dead in his tracks, mid-stride, and slowly turns his head, looking directly up the hill right at Randy, as if it could hear his thoughts. It can. It was pissed. It starts running up the hill toward Randy. That would really suck. This is a steep hill, about 300 yards. Randy watched this thing running up the hill only for a second or two. He said it was running impossibly fast, so fast in fact that he accounted the event to me in disbelief. He looked at its legs, half expecting to see wheels. Randy was able to observe that it was in fact a bipedal running straight at him, closing a significant distance uphill at a discerningly rapid velocity. Rand at this, on this okay, typo. Uphill at discerning a rapid velocity at this ungodly rate of speed, it would be upon him in several seconds. 
With great haste, Randy kicked a starter, which worked on the first try, thank Christ, and he didn't even look back as he peeled off as fast as he could. It struck me that Randy said specifically that the creature had no clue it had been made until the moment Randy thought I tricked it. There goes the boss. And then it looked right at him instantly and was quite obviously not impressed one bit as if it could hear his thoughts. So that's Randy's account. Another Dale Sand Matt story about his father-in-law's relationship with these creatures slash people around Buck Lake, Alberta, which will be brief, but I find it to be interesting nonetheless. Finally, still to come, my own personal experiences involving mind speak, lost knowledge, suppressed abilities, as well as conclusions which I have arrived at. My own story I really want to focus on while I write it out, as it's very important to me that I get it absolutely right. For those listening who may have inside knowledge or puzzle pieces but are too afraid of ridicule and other people to share it. A coward can die many times before his own death, but the valiant man may taste of death but once. Julius Caesar. Don't let fear stop you from doing what you know is the right thing to do, people. Thanks again, Steve. Take care, everyone. Well, holy shit, Jordan. Absolutely appreciate you, man. Appreciate you writing that in. I don't want to hear more. I'm waiting. And your buddy hit the nail on the head. Um, more commonly to point out that fact is how many people we've had who looked at them through binoculars or rifle scopes and said, quote, that thing looked straight back into my eyes through that lens. Right? And uh, everybody, not everybody, but I mean, What's the percentage of people who've seen these damn things, and even when they're facing away from them, looked, saw them, and the second it registers in their mind what they're looking at, that thing freezes mid-stride, even facing away. We've heard that numerous times. What's up with that? <clears throat> and that is probably has something to do with why the majority of people that intentionally go looking for them don't see them. Right? Because they are transmitting through their brain the entire time a pre-warn of what their motive is, what they're doing, and why they're there, right? Meanwhile, I'm running around where they are all the time, and I am nonstop saying in my mind, leave me alone. I don't give a shit about you. Leave me alone. Sort of works. Actually, uh, last... I didn't really mention this. It's not really important. It's no big deal, but last... Friday, I think I headed up to the coast. Friday or Thursday, I don't know. Yeah, I stopped at this river, and where I stop at the river is where I've been filming Steelhead, and it's also where a couple new First Nations friends have seen these things numerous times. And I stopped, and I went down to the river, because I always go down this one through the bush to the edge of the river, and I peek down both ends like that to see if I can catch any elk in the middle of the run, and I can videotape them, and I do that chronically non-stop and I finally did pull off videotaping a bull elk walking down the middle of the run and uh, and I 100% heard branches breaking on the other side of the river um, not close to me though it sounded like it was back in the woods a bit but I 100% heard it the second I stepped down to the water and stopped got quiet um, I heard something in there but I just ignore it I got two chickens coming in here looking for somewhere to drop some eggs. Damn things. We find eggs everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Okay, that's a good one. <clears throat> I shouldn't say that's a good one. I mean, that's, uh, that's a good, clear one for me to read. Very very uh, easy to take in. And it pointed out some, some puzzle pieces for many, I'm sure. Here comes another one. And you know, it's funny, you guys. I had like 800 and something in my notes right here. And I and um, I thought that I was starting to get the list down. And now I'm back up to like 1,300 or something. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it freaking amazing? And it's also, it should make some people freaking angry. Of how common this is, right? And how we're not formally educated. But 
we are getting educated now. Now, before I start, this coffee's kicking in. Let's get somebody else heard. Lights that followed me from above. Excuse me. Hey, Steve, I started watching your channel a couple years ago to listen to your bear encounter stories before traveling to Montana for a fly fishing trip. I've been hooked ever since. And once I heard about the other paranormal encounters, I was hooked even more. 33 years old, Air Force veteran, a Christian, and an avid outdoorsman. That being said, I believe that Scott Carpenter has pinpointed what these beings in the deep woods could be. I've personally not seen anything resembling a Sasquatch, but I do remember vaguely something weird that happened when I was very young. As a young kid, I had chores to do at night, like feeding the goats or dogs and gathering firewood to bring to the porch at night. I don't know my age or the date, but I know I was young. And that one night when it was dark, I had a light from above follow me around my yard. When I first noticed the light, I ran around in circles, waving my arms, almost trying to brush it off of, off of me. It was as if a flashlight was shining directly down on me and followed me around. When I ran inside freaking out, my mother told me it was probably a bat. Now that I'm older, I realized my mom was probably confused and just wanted me to stop freaking out and told me something silly to calm my nerves. When I was discharged from the military in 2014, I saw a green flare-like light come down from the sky and burn out above the treetops of my parents' 40 plus acres of woods, twice now. I always thought that was weird, but I don't fear these things because all my faith and hope is in Christ. I'd like to know if anyone else has had similar experiences. Thanks for what you do and be safe out there, Jim. Okay, Jim, thanks, man. Uh, all right, there you go, you guys. Anybody familiar with that? Uh, talk about it in the comment section below, possibly. Or if you got something significant, you think it will help somebody, then email it to me, all right? I thought I was cleaning up the computer last evening for a quick half hour and I came across that video clip of those bright lights that I videotaped in the coastal mountains in minus 25 at 4.35 in the morning, whatever it was. I thought about reposting that for everybody to have a look again, but in the end it's just a bright light in the, up in the mountain, right? Whatever. It doesn't bring too much knowledge to us except for the fact that it's real, a real bright light. It's just a simple title, a Bigfoot. Hi, Steve. I recently started working at a trucking facility, and I met a new friend, Jason, there that is a flatbed truck driver. He told me about your site, and I was hooked. I've had a lot of supernatural things in my life go on. Don't know why me, but I guess, lol, people call me a sensitive or empath. I see many strange and hard to explain things as a child. I usually just kept it bottled up, not to be made fun of or to be called crazy. Now 58, I have grown children of my own. I found, and I have found people still judge. But at this stage of life, I don't really care. My children also have a sensitivity to strange things. Also, I raise them to always say how it is. Be aware of their surroundings and always be open to different things. Well, here's my story and I hope it's not too long, but I believe it's worth it. Okay, there's no Punctuation. Okay, you guys, be patient. Not talking about this further. In the late 70s, my brother bought some land in the Garrison, Minnesota area, 80 acres. It was in the backwoods on a dirt road, no lakes on it, but marsh and creeks. It's the second last cabin on a dead end dirt road. So, well, there were. There we were, building the cabin. My parents and I and my sister stayed in a pop-up camper on the weekend one night when her and I went to bed earlier and the adult stayed at the fire outside. We were about 12 and 14. Our camper was right next to the wood line, almost touching the trees. We were laying there when sounds of rustling and low growls came from the tree line next to us. We told the adults, but they dismissed it. It's just the woods. Later in the years, I know what we heard. So after the cabin was built, where we could now stay inside, my brother and friends were there alone. They heard noises coming from Big Red, which is an old UPS truck that they had parked out for storage in the yard in the back. 
They heard this on different occasions until one day they heard it so loud that something started running down the old game trail. He saw the tall grass and trees moving. His trail led to the creek. Well, they sold it. Well, they said it was on two legs just ahead of them. And then it disappeared. No one, no one really ever went past the creek. It was like eerie and just weird feeling. Only one person ever ventured over there, my skeptic mother, LOL. She didn't believe in nothing. One year we were looking for a Christmas tree. She got lost for hours. After falling in the marsh to her waist, she found a small piece of land she could stand on, found the sun setting, followed that home. We were just in the process of calling the rescue team. She said it was a very still, she said it was a very still strange back there. And nevertheless, she never went back in about 1978. My sister and I had a couple friends up with us for the weekend. We decided to walk behind Big Red about 300 feet. There was a marsh and woods. We did not go into the woods, but just stood and goofed off by the marsh. Until suddenly, we heard what sounded like motorboats going fast on the lake. Well, as I said, there were no lakes. A weird sound came on, like a loud heartbeat. We then decided to get out of there quick. Fast forward to the fall 82. My dad was up at the cabin alone. He'd done this often after putting his stuff in the cabin. He decided to get some firewood before it got dark. Now it was just dusk. So we went back behind the cabin to the long wood pile. He put a couple logs into his arms. As he bent down, he was backing up. He felt a presence knowing he was alone. He turned around very slowly. Then he saw the reddish brown hair, like it was a coat or something. But then he looked up. My dad is six foot two and he don't look up often. Right there within chest, the seven to eight foot creature with hair all over it did not move. But my dad dropped his logs and hurried to the truck. Luckily, he'll, he still keeps them in his pocket today. Keeps what in his pocket? Oh, hair? Too, to look at right there. He backed up and ran as fast as he could to the truck, drove to the neighbors down the road. He said he did not look back to see if it was chasing him. Then in the spring of 82, I'd gotten married. We stayed at the cabin for a week. Then that last Saturday, family was coming up. With well, the last day alone, we had drove into the town of Brainerd, Minnesota. We arrived back right before dusk as my new husband brought the loads of stuff into the cabin. I decided to go pick up the blanket that we had left on the lawn earlier that day, facing the tree line of the yard, when there was about a 15-foot tree line in front of me. There he was, seven feet or at least, tall, big. He almost had a glow about him because when I think back, the moon wasn't out enough to shine yet on him, and I don't believe we had a yard light yet, but he could have. But oh my God, I yelled and started running to the cabin about 50 feet away. My husband comes running with a shotgun thinking I was being attacked by an animal. Again, the creature Bigfoot never chased me, but I was so scared. I think we stayed up all night waiting for the family to come in the morning. Remember, there was no phone at the cabin, no cell phones back then. So, 1984 in October, my brother died at the cabin. My sister-in-law couldn't stand it to keep. So it was sold. So in about 2010, my sister and her husband had a co-worker from his job who stayed with them during that week and would drive home on the weekends. Well, he happened to be from Garrison, Minnesota. In fact, he told them to come up one weekend. My sister was shocked. Here he was. The property was connected to the other side of our 80 acres. We used to have, what a small world. So she asked her, have you ever seen anything out here? And his wife replied, well, I've seen Bigfoot a few times, walk from the woods, cross the road, which was dirt, up to the abandoned old Boy Scout camp, way up in the road. Then my sister explained our experiences. You can use my name, it's Sandy. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. No problem, Sandy. If you ever read it again, make sure you throw down the punctuation. It's way easier, but uh, we got the gist of it anyway. Brainerd, Minnesota. It sounds like another frickin' hotbed, right?
Oh, I just got a fresh text from the outfitter. I got service for a second. Let's see if I can read it to you guys. This is going to be so interesting to me. Yeah, both my guides. It's the Indians I know that have a bush cabin. Really reliable bush people. I have two guides of two hunters that saw one once. The Indians are having them come in and bug them at this cabin all the time. Got video, but don't see anything. Be sure as hell can hear them. They've been having tons of encounters lately. I'm going to spend some time with them in September. And he's typing right now. All right, well, I'll wait for him to type back more instead of replying. This is going to be insane. They've got video. i got goosebumps on my arms because I know that it's just, uh, it like really strikes home with me when I hear about the guides in camp. And now they're having this going on. they got video and hearing them. This is like, yeah, I'm getting total goosebumps. And he's typing more. It's poor bastards. Imagine having that season dropped on you. Here's another text. I have a sat phone set up, but it's really shitty service. Wi-Fi is decent, but that's so strong. Okay, so if you guys are curious, I just said, he was said about the sat phone, I said, yeah, I get it, sat phones can suck it. I said, I'm up to my nuts busy right now, I'll text later today, tell them, and then I put caps, cap locks not to shoot one, unless it's full on self-defense, because if you do, the outcome won't be good. Talk later. There you go. That's what I say to everybody in my field. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't go out and shoot one if you get the chance to. Just don't do it. They're peeking in your window at kids or beating on your door. Game on, right? Game on, but just because something's standing there hairy looking at you has no green light to shoot it unless you really want your life messed up as far as I'm concerned. So it's gonna be interesting to hear back from those guys, isn't it? Oh, okay. Hold on, you get another reply. They're scared to death. I don't think they would even think of shooting it. Good. Sorry. <laughs> I've never done this before. This is kind of rude, isn't it? Okay, I'm gonna to have to ignore the text. Get back to the, the voices and we'll get an update on this later. Got the video, crazy. Yes, I'll try to get the video, all right? Okay, Western Montana. My experience, missing time, photo evidence, orbs, large being. Steve, first of all, I'm very grateful for your channel and all the work you do on this topic. I've been watching you for years, way before you even talked about the hairy beings in the forest. I love how you tell the story. You're super funny too. I don't mind the cursing at all. Honest language usually is expressive, lol. I sent my story in a long while back. It's very complex to express what my experience was, but there is a lot to explain and far too much over one email. I'd love to have a quick phone call with you or a Zoom, etc. I could probably relate my experience in 10 minutes talking, but far too much to write. But I'll try again and hopefully you get this one. I had an experience when I was in high school in the southwestern mountains of Montana. Did a root range up a road called Lost Horse. We we're all probably 16 or 17. Me and two friends had gone up a boulder field, then climbed up a mountain off trail. There's a lot of weird stuff that went on. One friend basically ran away, and my other friend started not feeling well. But since we were off trail, I knew we had to go after the friend that ran away. I had to press my friend who was still with me, not feeling well, to go after our now lost friend. I planned to get to the top of the mountain, so I convinced him to keep climbing with me. Pictures of him during this period where he wasn't feeling well shows orbs behind him and he kept telling me he was seeing bears that were hiding behind trees. I never saw anything and we were standing right next to each other. We went through the rest of the climb with many false peaks and at every false peak I would need to convince my friend to keep going. We had left early and it's about noon at this time. 
So we had lots of time to find our buddy. Okay, just got to keep going up. And we kept going every time. Eventually we reach a huge boulder field near the top. And again, there's bears apparently hiding behind trees across the boulder field. I never saw anything. I never even got nervous. I felt fine. No hair on my neck standing up. No feeling of doom. I was totally focused on finding a friend. My rule is always no man left behind. I'm very comfortable in the woods and climbing. And I know acting quickly is usually the best option. I wasn't worried about getting lost myself. I was worried about calling rangers hours later as we hike down the mountain knowing every step that it'll take them hours to get back up to that point and probably in the dark. I think my focus on finding my lost friend may have somehow affected my resistance to whatever was up in the mountains that day. We started up this last boulder field though and there was our lost friend. He's at the top of the boulder field. He was staring into the cliff at the top, just standing and staring into a rock face, looking almost dumbfounded. We called to him from below and he never turned around. That would have been spookier than shit. We climbed to the boulder field calling him the whole time and we had to touch him on the shoulder when, he, when we finally got to him in order for him to look at us. He snapped too. Immediately he was like, where have you guys been? And began to act normal. We told him we've been calling him since the bottom of the boulder field and he's a nut for running away and we wanted to go back. Told him he's a nut and asked him if he fell or anything, but no, he was fine. So now being at the top, we climbed the wall and snapped a few pictures. It was super cold, even though it was summer, over 11,000 feet high. So we decided to cruise back down quickly. When we decided to go back down, it was maybe 1 p.m. and we lost we all lost seven hours. At 8 p.m. we all came to, at 8 p.m. we all came to in a boulder field at the base of the mountain, about two miles from our truck. I was in front and I was huffing and puffing like I ran a marathon. My first thought was, every man for himself, and I don't know why. 30 seconds and I was almost normal and I saw my two friends clamoring over the boulder field behind me, coming toward me like they were being chased. So I let up and I, and I was trying to calm them down, telling them from hundreds of feet away to slow down because they kept falling into the boulder field rocks trying to move quickly. I thought they might break a leg and they were already falling and scraping themselves up pretty good. We all got out, but the friend that went running off has been sick ever since. At first they thought mono and multiple diagnosis for the past 12 or more years. He is just sick every day and doctors don't know why. He was a state champion tennis player and was in the, and was in the running to be the valed, valedictorian. <clears throat> we would run 16 miles in a day and go fishing at 5 a.m. the next day. He's never been the same. My other friend that's with me proceeded to take sick the next day and drink all the beer in the house and he wasn't a drinker at all. We were 16 or 17 maybe and he drank 18 beers and acted like the whole hike never happened. <clears throat> oh poor bastard. <clears throat> Excuse me you guys. Me, I had dreams of the missing time. I knew there was a being and years later through a dream I found the pictures and I asked them both about it. My friend who went running has no recollection of the hike at, at all. My friend who stayed with me has begun to remember, and the more he remembers, the more it freaks him out. I remember now most of it, but I'm still missing time. I think we were escorted out by one of these beings, but I think it was an old one. One that knew things. I think it first off kind of zaps you to numb your thoughts. Have you ever just stopped while walking your dog to see what they do, they sometimes don't notice for a while. And I think that's what these beings do. They numb your mind and you stop while the rest of the group moves on. Then they take you, just a theory. But it would line up with David's research and is possible. I know I lost time and I changed locations during that time. Not sure if we were chased or transported. Felt like we were being chased, I was exhausted like I ran a marathon. Anyway, that's it. I hope you read it.
share my name and I have a lot more about this story I could not include due to the length, but I have many thoughts and theories, photos from the hike. I can show you where I, where I went on a map. And no, I have not been back up there to take photos again, but I'd like to soon. Did you say to use your name? I'll just call you Chris. Okay, Chris, appreciate it. Um, definitely something Dave's going to be interested in hearing, without a doubt, it's right up his alley where he's focused now. Do I think it's these beings that are taking people? Myself? No, I don't. Not at all. Because I think if they were... Well, who knows? I mean, who knows? But I just think of common sense and, and the knowledge I'm gaining from listening to all the people and as well listening to Davis as well, right? The amount of people that see these beings. You know, there's people that claim to be, I think they were hurting us, trying to get us to a choke point for an ambush. Not a chance in hell. Not a chance in hell. These beings, if they want you, they're going to walk right up to you, put their hand on the back of your neck, squeeze a little bit and pick you up. This, that's what they're going to do. They don't have to ambush us. They don't have to trick us. They don't have to zap us so we fall behind. These beings want your ass. They're just going to walk up and take it. All of, all of you. Right? So, what's taking us? What's taking the people? What the hell's going on in the, in the granite fields? What's going on with the, with the granite and the water? I don't know. Does somebody know? Probably. But I don't know for certain myself. If these beings were into taking us, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would have been gone a long time ago. Think about it. Think about the places that I go. I've probably been to every freaking Sasquatch hotspot in British Columbia, not looking for them, but I've been there and I've been by myself how many times and without a tracker and many times at just a bow and arrow. Right? I am the ultimate candidate to be taken if that was what these beings are doing. I don't know. I'm interested to hear more. When can I do the phone call? <sighs> Who knows? Who knows? This is all I can do right now. Look at what I've done in here. Nothing. I've done anything to get this place going. And yesterday I was starting to really think about getting that one room that was going to be a suite for people to stay. I was thinking about just turning that into the perfect soundproof place to get the shit going on. But I need the time yet. And that's not going to be happening for a bit. Time. It's amazing. It's frustrating. It's frustrating wanting to, wanting to do so many things at one time in this lifetime. It's frustrating to go through life thinking you got no time left. It's a feeling I've always had. It's like I'm running out of time. I always felt it. Forever. Thanks for sending that, man. Send more. All right? You got more? Send it. This title, Only One to See It. Hi, Steve. I really don't know how to start to even explain this experience. My name is Pamela, and to many I sound like I'm crazy, but here it goes. I would say it was the fall of 2007. Me and my friends had gone to hang out and was coming back home to Harrison, Michigan. A long way back. I'm riding the back seat and my two friends are up front chatting away. We come up on a detour. We really have to take the long way back now leading us almost back in the opposite direction. It's after midnight so we continue along the way. They're still chatting along and I'm staring out the front window feeling car sick. Up ahead I see at the edge of where the headlights reach trash thrown across the road and a garbage barrel tipped over on its side. As we get closer, this being stands up. I'm guessing at about eight feet tall, grayish in color and very massive. I'm frozen and in shock and I can't speak to tell my friends to pay attention to this thing. All I can do is stare and watch as it steps over the garbage barrel like it's nothing and keep walking, stepping over a fence. Yes, with just one stride stepping over a fence and off into the field. The voice finally comes back, and I say to my friends, Oh my God, did you see that thing? As I'm fanatically looking out the side window, trying to see it in the field. It was gone, and my friends are laughing at me, saying it was probably a bear. Bears don't step over fences on their hind legs. Still to this day, they make fun of me about it, but I know what I saw that night. Thank for what you do, Steve. I don't feel alone when I hear others' experiences. 
And welcome to the Club and No Return, Pam. And there's no going back. Right? No going back. No going back. And then now you have to go through what we all go through, which is every single time you leave the house, drive by a patch of forest or any highway or remote, once you get away from the city, you're scanning for the damn things nonstop. You can't stop yourself. And I know you know what I'm talking about. It's weird they hit the garbage, isn't it? Isn't it really weird that they hit the garbage so often? I find that kind of odd. Something that can outclass and overcome basically any known mammal that we are, animal that we are aware of. I mean, these things just go grab a deer anytime they want it. Why go scavenge for food unless they just got here and that was the first thing they found that they could possibly find something to eat? And there is a possibility, right? I don't know. Kind of makes sense to me. It's funny, you know, uh, the outfitter that just got a hold of me as we were reading, um, there you go. He has been guiding basically all of his life, remote British Columbia, the Yukon Northwest Territories and more, and never accepted the fact, never had any interest and never seen any one of it, and never seen one of these things his whole life. I know for a fact he, has been guiding for at least 20, he has got to have been guiding for at least 25 plus years. He's probably been guiding for 25 years, a little more, I'm guessing, and probably been in the bush for another 15 years beyond that, right? So you think about how many people, well, I would've seen one. If they were real, I would've seen one by now. I've been everywhere. Doesn't mean shit, that doesn't mean shit, proven proven just now, again, from the outfitter who's in contact with me. Now, that is what gives me the fuel to think that maybe possibly a lot of these beings that are being seen, it's their first time here, possibly. Because like uh, there's a report uh, 100 miles north of Fort Nelson, BC, and I was pipelining up there where this went down, and the welder I was years ago. I was up there during 9-11, the year, the winter after 9-11, I was up there pipelining instead of going to the States for the winter, which I normally would have. And the welder I was working with, who coincidentally grew up like three blocks away from my childhood home, he was up there when the sighting went down of two guys up on the, up on the, whatever it's called, the pipe and the flames are they're blowing off the excess uh, natural gas or sour gas, whatever it's doing, that flame on top up there. And there's a ladder goes up the platform and they were stuck on that platform looking down as this huge hairy thing kept walking around the lease and it'd walk around and squat down and sit there and look up at them, just watch them. And it'd walk around a little bit and watch them. And uh, they, they said that even the National Enquirer showed up. Uh, news reporters from all over the freaking place showed up up there a hundred and some odd miles of ice road to get up to that camp to find out what the scoop was. Police were up there the whole nine yards. I saw the news clipping of it. But anyway, my take on that, because those oil, the oil fields out there, those, those, those towers with the flames coming off of them are all over the place. You drive the Alaska Highway at nighttime, you see them on the horizon everywhere. So there's nothing mesmerizing about it, especially if you live up there full time in the forest. It's just gonna be a part of your life from the day you were born. So. Why the amazement? That's what my brain picked up on was, why the amazement of this thing as it squats down looking up at them in the tower like, holy shit, what is that? As it's slowly circling around, squatting again from another angle, oh my gosh, what is that? Right? Especially right there in the middle of the oil fields. And if it's been there full time, it's seen those flames and those towers all its life. What's so mesmerizing about it? What's so surprising about it? Did you just get here? It's the first one you've seen, right? And now we got our outfit, everybody. Outfitter friend. They've had that outfit where they are right now forever. And only now, it sounds like a few of these beings have showed up for the first time and they're raising havoc. Why is that? If they've been there the whole time, why did they wait till now? Did they just get there? Have they never been there before? You know what I mean? There's far too many clues for me, the way my brain fires, that leads to me to thinking possibly these individuals, some of them, 
just got here. I don't know. Somebody knows. Here we go, let's hear some more. It killed my dog part three. Okay, now this is why I encourage everyone to share all they got in one email because who knows when we're gonna to get to it and who knows when part one and two, how long ago it was. Killed my dog sounds familiar, but this is why. Okay, you guys, but I'm gonna read this. Hopefully it makes sense to us. I would have added this to my last email, but I hadn't thought about it. Tell my buddy that was with me, called me to chew my ass for telling you about the Sasquatch killing my dog. He just say he isn't too happy. I didn't know that he followed your channel, that he was so freaked out about the repercussions of me telling you this. I told him to grow a pair. I understand why it scares him, but I'm tired of keeping it a secret. And if people want to think I'm crazy, that's fine. But I guarantee one thing, they won't say it to my face because I don't give a damn what they think. I know what I saw and did that day. And if I have to answer for it when I get to the pearly white gate, so be it. Now, for what I remember of the little details, I remember it had human-like facial features. And that it, when I had yelled at it and stood up to face us, that it had kind of snarled and bared its teeth at us. My buddy reminded me also that after I shot it the first time, that it grunted like it had the wind knocked out of it. I still carry the same 30 odd six I used that day and I never felt under gun. My buddy has upgraded to a 375 H&H now because of what happened. The one thing that I remember that stood out the most to me was the size of his hands. When it had my dog by the neck, its hand wrapped all the way around it and that its fingers were twice the size of mine and I got big hands. The back of its hand was covered in black hair but his fingers were bare and the skin was almost a light gray pinkish color. Everything happened so fast that it still don't seem real. What I don't understand about these beings is why they hate dogs so much and why it went after our dogs in the back of the truck. This one was obviously not scared of the dogs. I know as soon as that bastard reached into the bed of my truck that my blue healer went after him and that she put up a fight. I just don't get it. Most people that I have talked to personally about this subject say their dogs run and hide from them. I hope one day to have the answers. I'm sorry for rambling on Steve and my emails being a mess, but me and my smartphone don't get along at times. I hope the family is well and this finds you in good health. Keep your powder dry, my friend and like the Hank Williams song, a country boy will survive. <laughs> yes, he will. Thanks for the follow up. I remember your story, man. To your partner that's living right now. Um, dude, think about what I do. Think about what I do every chance I get. And think about the, cr the, the crowds that I run in. And I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. All right, so pick up on my, pick up on Try to let me encourage you to cast that fear aside, man. Chuck it. Your fear is only a big, long chain with an anchor dragging behind you in life, all right? Free your ass up. Don't be a pussy, all right? Don't be scared. There's not, It's truth. It's honesty. Don't be scared of that shit. Just don't. <laughs> Probably not one of my best Tony Robbins motivational speeches, but I'll tell you what. What what, what else can I say? I don't, know, I don't know what more I can do to give all the people out there that are sitting there silent watching courage. I don't, know, I don't know how I can deliver to you guys any more clearer. I just gave an example of what I did the other day when somebody attempted to possibly put a little humiliation into what we talk about around, around a group of people that would be your worst nightmare to have shitting all over you and laughing at you. And... Uh, I shut them the F up in about 15 seconds flat, right? And they will never laugh at this topic again, I'll guarantee it. Don't be scared. Lead the way. Don't follow the scared kittens, all right? All right, hold on. It wasn't a long enough babble. Let's get a little more caffeine in me so I can get it longer. Just kidding. All right, what's this? This is title three and one, and my battery's about to die. 
Hey Steve, power to you and power to us as we awaken to this greater reality. I have three stories to share and I'll keep them brief, refraining from telling the life story of every person even remotely connected to them. Thank you. <laughs> I may even throw in a few commas, periods, and paragraphs as I go. Thank you again so much. My first story comes from my mom, so you can take this one to the bank. Sounds familiar, might have read it. My mom grew up on a farm in Northern Ontario, a tiny place called Moonbeam, Ontario. Ironic, I know. One morning in early spring, my grandfather was enjoying his coffee looking out over the back 40. Then as he described it, the biggest bear he'd ever seen ran out of the bush on two legs straight up to his 1,200 pound prize bull and with a single swat broke the bull's neck. Read this. It's not too long, I'll read it again for those who haven't heard it. Then, like a groom scooping up his bride to carry her across the threshold, turned and headed for the bush. My grandfather grabbed his gun and made it out, of, out onto the back porch just in time to see his prized bull disappear into the woods. He tracked the pair for a half a kilometer, then poof, nothing. Stranger still is the fact that at no point had this creature put the 1,200 pound bull down which would have been easy to detect since there was still plenty of snow on the ground. Snow. My grandfather probably died believing that was the biggest bear he'd ever seen. Something tells me it was no bear. Second story. In 67, I was 10 and was trapping with my other grandfather up the Groundhog and Ivanhoe Rivers. He built a cabin at the junction of the two rivers, the furthest point of the loop. As we arrived at the cabin late that day, which was about 200 feet from the river, we knew something was wrong. First, there was a terrible stench in the air. Sorry, cat just walked in here, caught my attention. As though someone had lit a dog on fire. Then as we made our way up to the camp, I could tell by the look of my grandfather's face, this was no bear attack. The door had not only been open, but was completely missing, only to be found a hundred yards up the trail. Next, the 300 pound cook stove was also missing only to be found the next day a hundred yards down the trail. This sounds familiar. That uh, remote camp that I rode into years ago with the wall tent being 150 yards down the river. In the cabin, every box, every container had been opened. Even every individual wooden match box in a case of 20 had been opened. My grandfather said nothing to me. I guess he did not want to freak me out any more than I already was. Strangely enough, that was the last year my grandfather trapped, no doubt. Third story, 1995, I was working at a healing center in Australia where we would take people through a 10 day cleansing and healing. We would often have healers, Aboriginal shamans and psychics come to work with us. On one occasion, we had a psychic woman come. She asked we the staff to cut pics out of magazines and put them in envelopes so she would later tell us what they were. My pick was the famous Patterson Sasquatch photo. That night she was batting 1,000 correctly, naming what each pick in the envelope was. When she got to my envelope, she picked it up and her face went completely dead pan. Dropping the envelope, she said, <clears throat> excuse me, they are working with the ETs and disappearing people. They must be stopped. <clears throat> That's interesting. I opened the dropped envelope and sure enough, a shaman friend once told me that amongst his people, they believe that when the Sabe Sasquatch shall make their presence known, it'll she be, it shall be a sign of end times. I think that time is rapidly approaching. I also believe that like skunks, they can turn that smell on and, on and off. All right, and there you go. Are they involved with Taking people? I don't know. People who know a lot more than me say no. And I haven't had any evidence yet for myself of these beings being directly involved with taking people. Then again, you know another thing as well, um, nobody's ever seen any of these things making a tree structure, <laughs> right? Commonly there's tree structures and footprints around and noises, but nobody's ever seen one making one that I know of. Then again, we don't really have to see shit to believe, do we? This topic proves that one. All right, thanks for sharing that. That's a really interesting one, isn't it? 
There's another one. Rocks thrown in Kentucky. Dear Steve, my experience took place in Carter County, Kentucky in the early 1980s on a gravel route outside of Grayson. We were taking my uncle's girlfriend home, and on the road was an old wooden bridge over a shallow creek. There's also a way around the bridge where you could actually drive through the creek, which a lot of people did because of the poor condition of the bridges on the rural roads there in those days. We were in my grandfather's 4x4 Chevy, and a stop short of the bridge, debating on whether to go over or around. When out of the woods came a bombardment of small rocks hitting the truck. We were in the middle of nowhere, Steve. There weren't any houses in at least a mile or any other signs of anyone in the area. Whoever or whatever was throwing the rocks was on a heavily wooded hillside in complete darkness in the middle of the night. I'm 48 now and had forgotten all about this till watching your videos. I've learned since of other people having experiences in that area and wonder if any of your other viewers have had anything to share. Thanks for all you do and keep it real. Your friend, Jeff Stevenson. You can use my name if you want. Okay, Jeff, there you go, man. Scan the comment section below. If anybody could, please, possibly, Share what you know in the comment section below for the kind man who just shared his experience, all right? Here's another one. I'm going to kind of get going quicker here because the phone's going to beat it. This is titled Bipedal Wolf. Hey, Steve. <clears throat> First of my condolences on losing Mr. McRoy. Thank you for reading this. And I'm Mike from Northeastern PA. I've had two Sasquatch experiences, as well as one with a bipedal wolf. Here's the wolf story. This creature came down out of heavy woods and crossed a small back road down on all fours. When it reached the northern boundary of our field, it had stood up on its hind legs and tried to hide itself between two mulberry trees. That would be so freaking creepy to see that shit. Its head touched a branch that was approximately 12 feet off the ground. My father would later measure its height. It then ran south again, at first bipedally, then dropped down on all fours at an unbelievable speed. It covered 100 plus yards and ran out of the southern boundary of, our, boundary of our field into the county road my father and I were traveling west in, in our family station wagon. From nose to tip of its tail, it covered the county road from shoulder to shoulder, approximately 20 feet. While it was transitioning from two legs to four, you could see its front paws were elongated with huge claws and were more like a hand. We were traveling in an old 71 American Motors Matador station wagon. We barely missed hitting it. it left, its left side was facing us as we traveled west and it was running south. Its left shoulder was about, a, was about one foot above the center of the hood of our car. When measured, it was three feet off the ground, putting its left shoulder at approximately four feet tall. As it ran in front of us crossing the road, it turned its head toward us, snarled, showing all of its teeth, including canines, that were at least six inches long. It had huge amber eyes and just looked plain evil. The gentleman who owned the woods and came out of had, a, had about 12 guard dogs. He lived alone like a hermit and owned about 100 acres, which included several long retired slate quarry holes. They were all filled with clear blue water and huge fish. The woods were also full of deer. And by the way, our newly built home is only about 50 more yards west of where it ran south across the road in front of my father and I. And this is September 3rd, 1975. A few nights after this incident, about 1 a.m. in the morning, World War III broke out. You could hear his guard dogs fighting and being slaughtered. Mr. Hermit opened up with a 12 gauge and kept firing until, as I would find out later, nine of his 12 guard dogs were slaughtered. It was still warm at this time and we had our windows open. This was also an extremely rural area at this time and sound carried like a concert hall. Our area was under the PA State Police Jurisdiction. Several troopers showed up that night, but by daybreak, their tactical team showed up and landed their chopper in our field. Sorry, guys. 
My father worked third shift at the time at Inger's, Inger's Soul Rand. I was just taking home. Let me read that one more time smoothly. My father worked third shift at the time at Ingersoll Rand. I was just getting home. After my mother explained that my father was going on, she made him promise to work days and get off nights. He then put a loaded 12 gauge by the front door. My father then immediately w walked up to the hermit's property, he crossed our field and directly up his driveway and refused to let me go. My mother was so scared of the ordeal, we heard through our open windows <clears throat> the previous night she kept us all home from school. Shortly after I saw my father disappear up his driveway, small arms fire erupted. We were all looking out our kitchen window in the anticipation of the results. The state police chopper took off and hovered over the hermit's property. It dipped very low, then lifted something huge wrapped up in a tarp and cargo net. My father soon returned and told us the state police stated he and us are to forget about what we forget about what we saw. The barracks commander stopped in on his way out to reinforce this. We bugged my father to tell us what it was they shot and killed. My father was a short and stocky steel worker and built like a brick, you know what. This is the only time I ever saw fear in his eyes. The only thing he would say is that when he saw them shoot and kill, is that he saw them shoot and kill an extremely large wolf. I never spoke of it again, nor would he acknowledge my inquiries about it. I ease dropped on him and my mother talking about it. After we kids were supposed to be asleep, he said there were nine dead guard dogs and 12 gauge shotgun shells everywhere. By the next night, there was about, there was a loaded 12 gauge at every entrance door with double odd buckshot and my mom had a new handgun at the ready. My father got off night shift very soon after this. Since this incident, there's been no other incidences with bipedal wolves in our area. Thank you, Steve. This means the world to me, Michael. you got to thank me, man. I'm going to thank you for sharing that. That's a hell of a story to share, especially the description. Just the description of that thing alone would make how many people keep their mouth shut because nobody would probably believe them, right? And just like I said to everybody else numerous times, a uh, handful of years ago, myself, when I hear the dog man thing, I just kind of brush it off because I'm like, yeah, right. But not now, not me. Why? Because all of you have shared what you've seen when it comes to those upright dog-like things. And uh, it's a shitty thing to be forced to accept, but if you don't accept it by now, after looking into it, hearing everybody, you're a bit of a moron, right? You're not the smartest pickle in the jar if you're not listening to the people. So, on that note, what I can tell you guys, what I know about wolves, and let's just say that these things have the DNA of a wolf. The number one thing that all wolves do not tolerate is other canines, including other wolves. Trust me, I know a lot about wolves. I probably had over 200 dead ones in my hands over the years. And I pursued them numerous times when they become a problem. I know a lot about wolves but they do not, they do not stand for the presence of any other canine, no matter what the species or the size, they just don't. They kill them, they kill them, and they kill all of them on sight. But one thing that is, my curiosity is, is because wolves are a pack animal, I think I've had a couple people say, and they've seen two to three dogmen at the same time, but it's not very common. It's always one, right? It's usually just one. And that, um, that's a little odd if it is, if they are directly related to wolves with at least most of the DNA, which is sounding like it. Why are they not in packs? Probably thank God they are in packs. And are there other beings or are there other very knowledge-filled human beings that um, know how to find these things and dispatch them when they need to. I don't know. I haven't a clue, but I got the wheel. It's, it's got my wheels spinning, right? I don't know. Like I said before, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. Um, I still stand firm with, I see something of that description and it's looking at me 
it's gonna get a big hole in it real fast. That's all there is to it. It's gonna get a hole in it. Like I said, it probably doesn't wanna come up and hump my leg or play fetch a stick, right? Anyway, um, I gotta get moving. I got shit to do. And I have to get back and uh, I gotta get in a good conversation with um, the outfitter. I wanna try to share with him what I can. He's gonna go into that camp, I think he said in September. And uh, we'll see what they have. What, I'm gonna find out exactly what it is he heard from the video. He said he can't see anything in the video, but he sure as hell heard them. So that'll be interesting to hear what they recorded. And uh, like he said, his, his crew is scared to death. Right? I think I forecasted that one. What a shitty thing. Gosh, because for me, Northern, that Northern life for me is where about three quarters of my soul sits nonstop. That is my heaven. That was my calling in life. And um, it would just really, 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 really suck to have that comfort, that comfortable place uh, tainted and not so comfortable anymore. Instantly, instantly um, becoming a negative place for you. That would just be such a shitty, shitty hand to be dealt, right? So, I hope that's not going to happen to that crew. I hope they can deal with this. I also urge them not to, uh, not to tell the hunters that come and go right away unless you have to tell them. Unless they hear it too. Because you don't want to ruin their time, right? As they're up there. And then it, and it's also as well a business. you got to get that business transaction, meaning the guided hunt. You need to get that business transaction done smoothly and successfully so that you can uh, feed your kids and pay the bills, right? COVID was enough to uh, smash the shit out of all the outfitters the past couple of years. Now this is going to get dropped on them. It'd be interesting as well to find out how many camps they have this going on. Is it just the one camp? Or are all the camps getting it? Who knows? I can find out and then I'll share with all you guys. One more quick mention is I got another email from a scientist to fill in more. And just from that one, what I shared about, I gave a slip up of the DNA studies they sent in, but they now have even more sent in, right? So that is why I said to you guys, I always share right away what I get to share with you guys what I can, but it doesn't make sense for me to share it all tidbit by tidbit because it can get confusing and not make sense. And then all of a sudden there's more added on a couple of weeks later. So, but just so you know, they are diligently working at creating this big package and they haven't stopped and it's getting to be substantial size. All right. There you go. Enough of me babbling. Time to get my shit going here. Gotta get the horses in. I'll talk to you in a little bit. Be safe. Book it at howthunt.com for fishing in August only. Sam and Halibut. And share my story at howthunt.com to get some shit off your chest. There's some knowledge shared. And quit being scared. <laughs>